as I can yeah, get more information. Yeah. Okay. We are good to go. All right. I always love how all of these Facebook lives start with everyone like looking down at their phone. And it's like, no one's actually talking. And it's like, hey, what's going on over there in that Facebook live? I know we need like an intro. Oh, good. We're already getting a couple of people dropping on. Will you guys let us know that we can hear you? And if you're um, watching, drop your um, what your role is on your team and what area of the country you're in, because you guys all know, I, I believe in the three X role to bring in three times your salary and GCI to the team. So maybe you guys can get referrals from today's conversation. So good, I see people jumping on. Um, this will be recorded and it will stay live in the group. So don't worry if you have to jump off, you can always come back or you can invite your friends to come back um, and watch it later. So we are just gonna dive right in. We took a poll recently about what you guys wanted to um, chat about. Elizabeth and Stephanie and I um, have had the great pleasure of just masterminding together over the years. And we thought, well, why don't we just open that conversation up to the whole group? And this is not gonna be a class. This is gonna be a total conversation. So I wanna see your comments um, and your questions down below. And we'll be monitoring those as we go. Um, and we are not the wisdom in the group. This is a collective group, um, collective of wise people. So we want to hear from you guys. <laughs> but before we start, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves because if you're in this group, you are either an alumni of the Be a Boss class or you have come to the retreat last year or are registered for this year or you are a coaching client or you're in our training center and group coaching. So you may know Elizabeth or Stephanie or me and not the other two. So Elizabeth, you wanna start and introduce yourself. Yes, um, I am Elizabeth Gilbert and I started in real estate in 2004. So it's been a long time. Um, and I've loved every minute of it. I have transitioned um, from um, starting as an EA to director of ops, and that's on three separate teams. It's been a progression, so I haven't haven't made that change with just one team, which I think has given me some good perspective on how teams work. Um, currently, I we're on track this year uh, to do 125 units, probably close to 25 million, um, hopefully closer to 27. Is and this where you are? No, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Yes. There's a difference, by the way. There's a state line, and I'm on the Missouri side. <laughs> okay. Awesome. But I bet you have a great referral partner on the other side of the line. Absolutely. You know, the whole region, it's, it's Heartland MLS, and um, it's both Kansas and Missouri in one MLS in the Kansas City area. So, yeah, that's how that works. Awesome. Cool. And Elizabeth, you, I always give, everybody has a nickname in my world. So Elizabeth is the voice of reason. She's like the most calm and story. always has a great out, outlook and perspective. So awesome. So now we meet the systems queen, Stephanie. Hey, I am Stephanie Brackett. I'm the, currently the chief operations officer for Anderson Hicks Group out of Idaho Falls. I've been in real estate since 2006. So not quite as long as Elizabeth, but getting there. Um, I have been a buyer's agent, I've been an executive assistant, I've been a director of operations, and now a chief operations officer, and that is also on three different teams. And your team is tracking this year to do what? Um, it depends on if we get our expansion open, but somewhere between 800 and 1,000. Awesome. Big numbers. I love it. So, um, and you, did you say where you are? Idaho Falls. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. My low V3 tunes in and out. <laughs> Bear with me here. So, and I'm Christy Belt Grossman. I'm the owner of Ops Boss Coaching. And um, we've been around for almost four years now. And prior to that, I was the chief operating officer for the Belt team for 23 years, starting out as an assistant to two agents and building up a team that eventually um, had a billion dollars in sales. So we are with that going to dive right in. I want to tell you, we're going to give away, I have a book. Um, do, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I have literally stacks of books that I am so interested in reading and I'm always reading, but I never get around to them all. So I literally have not even cracked this book, but I'm going to send it to one of you today for being a great participator. So whoever is a great participator will get um, predictable success sent to them. 
And if you stay around to the end of the call, we have a great um, handout that Stephanie's provided that we're going to send to you as well. That will kind of encompass a lot of what we're talking about here with tracking. So let's dive in. First question, and this is a question for the whole group, not just for us on the call, and you guys can participate in the comments. Why do we track? What's the purpose of tracking? Like, why bother? Because it takes a lot of time and effort and energy to do all this. What's the purpose behind it? So, Steph, you want to start with that? Um, yeah, on my team, we are firm believers that data leaves clues. So data is what gives us the ability to um, predict future. Um, we can correct past issues. And it gives us a chance to be able to tur turn our focus on issues that need additional attention. So um, if you're trying to run a team without tracking, you're basically driving with a blindfold on. You have no idea where you're going. You don't know what's behind you. And um, yeah, it's not setting up for success if you're not tracking. So that's why we track because we believe, we truly believe that data leaves clues. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say it's a compass, like it, it tells you what direction you're going in. And if, if you're not going in the direction you want to go, how can you change that? The numbers will tell you, um, you know, every business is just a numbers game. And unless you're tracking the numbers, you won't know what the numbers are telling you. You're just acting entrepreneurially. And for us, our numbers are uh, very simple. And a bottom line number that's easy to track is um, your uh, net income that for the lead agent. Because I know for, for our lead agent, it takes a certain dollar amount just to run the business every month. And are we even making that number every month? Or is he having to come out of reserves? That's, yeah. that's my lead, lead number, the one that I look at every day, because I know that's the one he is looking at every day. That's the object of the game, right? Without yeah. that number, we're not around. Exactly. Another, um, so we have some comments about people about why um, tracking. Nicole, I love that. Um, you can't improve what you don't track, right? What yep. you focus on, what you measure grows. So the more we measure the behaviors, the activities, the results that we're looking at, the faster we're going to grow them. Um, we had another comment, numbers tell a story and they don't lie from yeah. Melanie. I love that comment. That's a great comment because a lot of times, Elizabeth, you just said this, entrepreneurial, we think we know what's happening with the business. We feel like we know what's happening, but right. do we actually know the facts right. of what's and you happening? Can't, well, you can't argue with the numbers either. If you're, if I'm saying a certain percentage of one agent's business comes from a certain source, that's, you can't argue with me whether that's, you know, from that person's COI or from ours. It's, it's obvious when you're tracking. Yeah, and it takes that. emotion out of any conversation. I, I mean, if you say, hey, our standard is for you to make 60 calls a day and you made 30, instead of saying, I feel like you're not doing your lead generation or it seems <laughs> like you're not really into it, it's like, hey, you were supposed to make 60 calls, you made 30. Like they can't argue with that. There's, right. there's no arguing with the numbers, it's a fact. Yeah. I love that. And Jen says, we track so we know what works and what doesn't. I love that. I'm, I looked up a couple quotes. I'm like such a statistics geek. Wait till you see the sheet at the end of this call that Stephanie sent of all the stuff that they track for their team that we're going to share with you guys. And I'm like, oh my God, I just love data. But I know for some people, all the data is really overwhelming. And so I want to give you two quotes that I thought were really good. Um, if statistics are boring, you've got the wrong numbers. So, right, statistics tell a story. Uh, yeah. so if this, there's no story there, then you're not looking at the right things. And we're going to talk about what are the right things. And then uh, another great quote I thought came from the chief um, economist for Google. And I think it's actually really interesting when we see what's happening in the industry, we see what's happening with Keller Williams going to KW Command and really putting to use all the data that we have gathered as a company over the years. Um, he said, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to visualize it, to communicate it, is going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades. And I think that's our role as operations people is, do we understand it? Are we processing it? Can we help our team visualize it? And are we communicating it? And what are we going to do with that? So let's go into our next question, which is, 
if I'm not sure what to track, where do I start? What do I track? And if I just kind of had to like put a dashboard on my car, I love how Ste Stephanie always uses analogies. That's, I love that. So if, you, if you've got your like miles per hour and you've got your gas tank and you've got your, your thing, I don't know. I don't know anything about my car. I just have a 2001 VW Beetle. It really only has like three gauges on it. It just but drives for like, you, right, Christy? <laughs> heat or cold, whatever. Your three basic things, like what would you guys start with? And by the way, you guys, I think one of the values that we're bringing of having this group is we've got all kinds of levels and teams of this group. And that's kind of what Elizabeth, Stephanie, and I represent too. Steph's on the really large power team end with 800 to 1,000 units. And Elizabeth is um, not on the lower end, but um, she specializes because of the group coaching with newer admin. She's um, working with a lot of eight, just agents and admin. So we can kind of represent the range. So let's kind of go down to the low. Where do I start? And then we'll grow it up. So what three things would you say are important to track on your team? The three that are A, the easiest, and B, the one that tells the story, um, I think the loudest, maybe not the loudest, because I might have to add a fourth. I'm going to have to add a third is um, net income, how much money you're making every month, and not only um, what you've made, but what's on the books. So, and include your, um, the listings that you have coming up that haven't hit the market yet, those still have a, a net income dollar amount that will be made in the very near future. And that's, that's in the pipeline, right? That's what we call the pipeline, is what do we have coming through by our agency agreement signed, I know they're going to buy in a range. So what is the dollar amount that, of money that we're going to net from that range? So you're very in, focused on cash flow. Yes, exactly. Which I think um, as a smaller team is, it's not that it's not important on a bigger team, but it's, yeah. it's vital. It is. It, it's the difference between, well, right. So we talk about how much money until the business goes out of business that can be that number. Because if my agent, if my lead agent has to bring a certain amount of money to pay the bills every month, salaries, his salary, all of our expenses, when I know what that number is and I see us not hitting that number or not going to be able to hit that number, I know my lead agent has to come out of reserves. I can also predict mood with that because trust me, he's not going to be a happy camper if he sees he's not going to make enough money to cover all the bills next month. And what can I do to mitigate that? Or what can I do to help improve that number now? Even realizing we're not going to realize that for another 60 days. So net income. I still track units because I still think that knowing um, average sales price is important because that was one of our metrics, was getting our average sales price up um, for a number of reasons. They're easier to work with when you have a higher price range. There's less problems with the house, all that good stuff. So that was our metric, was how do we raise our average sales price? Once we did that, we saw less problems, which leveraged the admin's time. And then um, volume because that's another easy one, is how much, um, when I track volume, I can see how we're improving month over month, or from July this year versus July last year. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but those are my top ones. And then if I could add a bonus one, and this goes, we'll talk about lead measures and lag measures too, but um, appointments, appointments gone on. How many appointments are the agents going on every week? That is a huge predictor of how much business we're going to have in the future. And getting that number from agents is difficult and yet I think necessary. And I'll be the first to admit, yeah, I'll be the first to admit that I've not been consistent with that. And I kick myself in the rear end every time I look at that number going, I need to be on top of that. And yet I do think it is important um, because yeah, if, even if agents don't want to track how many dials they made, how many, if you don't have a dialer, that can be difficult. How many contacts you made, that can be difficult. But they can look at their calendar and know how many appointments they went on. 
Yeah, and we're going to talk about how do you get that and who's tracking and how do you get that information later. Yep. So Steph, you have like five typed pages of things that your team tracks. How do you narrow it down to the, like, what are the top three on your dashboard <laughs> that tell you what you need to know for your business? I tell, you that's a great question. I'd love to know top three because <laughs> uh, a four hour meeting between our leadership team got us down to 12. <laughs> oh, bless you. Holy so, cow. Yeah. On our, and it depends, honestly, it depends on the department because we have certain things like in our ISA department, we have metrics that are vital to our ISA department. In our agent department, we have metrics that are vital to our agent metrics. So, I mean, if I had to narrow it down to three, I, I don't even know that I could. Honestly, we've been spoiled with so much data that I can't go back to not having the data. It's hard to not have it. It's hard to not have it. So, so Melanie's I, our current to... focus. Go ahead. Our current focus is rep in 30. We have found through data, through tracking, if we get a rep agreement signed within 30 days of meeting that client, our conversion rate on that is like 99%. So we are focused on getting our rep agreement signed within 30 days of first meet. So let's dial back because what I'm hearing is that focus changes depending on what your team is working on. And so let's dial back to beginning. If I am a newer um, setting up new systems on my team, I do want to have the basics, right? I want to track volume. I want to track GCI. I want to track um, net income, not just GCI. Um, and for me, units are really important. And those are all lag indicators. We're going to talk about leading indicators. And I think there's really important leading indicators to track too. And then once you have the basics in place, then we can add on all the other things. Um, for me, one of the things that was really important to track early on as opposed to later, and we continued to track it, and that was our source of business. Where was our business coming from? And I also used to calculate the average commission per um, the average commission for each type of business. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found over time is that there were certain businesses that were paying, I know we can't talk commissions, they are paying three roosters and some uh, kinds of business that were only paying two and a half or two roosters. And we thought, well, let's focus our time and getting more business that pays three roosters instead of the two roosters. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. For those of you who are newer on the call, we can't talk about commissions. So um, anyway, those are kind of the basics. And then let's see what our next question was. Honestly, if I was a brand new agent starting out, though, my really important ones is I need to know how many new leads I'm getting a day, right? How many appointments I'm generating off of those. It's the conversion metrics. Those are the most important, I think, for a brand new team. Like, get your conversion metrics tracked. How many new so leads? So, walk us through conversion metrics. So, how many leads? How many contacts you made, right? So, new leads, then attempts. How many attempts you had? How many you were able to connect with? How many you set an appointment with? How many signed a rep? How many went pending? How many went closed, right? So, those are your each of your conversion rates. Mm -hmm. So if you have those numbers, now you know your metrics. And the, the beauty of that is next year, when you go to plan your, your offsite planning or whatever you're doing to plan your next year's goals, you've got all your metrics, all your conversion rates, and you can say, okay, if I want to do this many units, yep. I'm going to need to make this many phone calls. Yep. I know the data. And I need this many make. leads yep. coming in. That was one of the first things that I started tracking when I joined up um, with my current mega, Ron Henderson was um, how, on his listing appointments and on his buyer appointments, how many he was converting. Mm -hmm. And I, we always played this game because he would write down when he went on an appointment. And I said, you can't write it on the appointments gone on list until you actually went on the appointment. Because what if he cancels last minute and you put that name up there? I'm like, how bad will you feel to erase an appointment? Because <laughs> it felt so good to put it up there in the first place and he was just eager to do it. Well, that's what we learned that he was only taking 50% of the listings that he went on. And then we started tracking why. Was it because he lost it to another agent? Was it because he didn't take it because he chose not to? Or was it because they decided not to sell after all? And once we started tracking that information, he got better at converting our... Uh, on the phone 
what is it like qualifying, qualifying on the phone before he went on the appointment. And then his conversion ratio magically went up. Yeah. And that comes Amazing. from seeing right? the numbers and seeing the data and saying, what story is this telling me and what can we do? I went to Tony Robbins Business Mastery for five days in 2011. One of the exercises he had us do was the 1%, um, the 1% tweak. So take every metric in your business. So like what Stephanie just described, how many leads are coming in, how many appointments or how many calls, how many appointments, how many buyer reps, how many contracts, how many closings. And if you tweaked each one by 1%, which is a very minimal tweak, mm -hmm. how much money would that add to your bottom line? If you do that exercise, it's phenomenal. And then you can go back and say, okay, well, how do we tweak? Do I need a new script? Do I need a different follow-up program? Do I need a different presentation? Like what are the little 1% tweaks we can make? And that's something you can do on the operations side um, to show your agents how they can grow their business. Super easy. Right. And it's, all, it's usually one of two things. It's either a skills issue or it's an activities issue. They're not doing enough of the things or they're not doing them well. Mm -hmm. So if you can figure out which one it is, they're either not making enough calls or they don't have great scripts when they're making the calls. And that helps you with each conversion. They're either do, not doing it well or they're not doing enough of it. Right. Not talking to enough people, not talking to the right people, not saying the right things. Correct. Um, okay. So let's say we, we now talked, we've got our basics in of what we want to track. Now our team is growing. What else can we layer on to our tracking and what else should we be tracking? There's I'll give you one community. that became really important for me that is actually, it's on a little bit of a different um, track than this. Um, and that is how many Mets are in our data bank and what our conversion ratios are. So I want to know how many people are in my data bank who um, total, who are METs, and last year, how many past clients did business with us or referred us, um, and what was the percentage of the total? And then this year, I can do my tweak, right? So now I can say, how many am I going to add to the data bank, and what is my conversion ratio going to be? And if I increase both those numbers, it should magnify the amount of business that we do. Yeah. Yep, definitely. And, and we get, I mean, once you're, when you first start, you're really, you're trying to keep your head above the water. You're trying to make sure that the bills get paid. You're trying to make sure <clears throat> that people are just doing the basics and getting contracts written, right? And as you get bigger and grow, it becomes more and more about profitability and ROI on lead sources. And you really start analyzing those numbers and making sure you're spending the right money in the right place, the right amount of money in the right places to deliver the best results. So Definitely ROI by source is a huge one. Yep. yep. And then profitability. There's a lot of teams out there that they're running a big team and they're doing big numbers, but they're not profitable, right? Yep. And, yep. and my mega always says, if you're at 10% or less in profit, you are one month away from shutting the doors. Yeah. And I'll tell you, there are people in Gary's mastermind that are not profitable. Yeah, absolutely. I just talked to a team this week that hit profitability for the first time in six quarters. Wow. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, and that's our, that's up to us. That's up to us on the op side. That's not just, oh, it's the salespeople's responsibility. Profitability is driven within from our systems just as much as it is from sales. So yep. um, if you guys are listening on the call, what other things are you tracking and um, Steph and Elizabeth, what other things are you guys tracking on your team besides the basics? Uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. Five pages of the <laughs> So if I'm kind of, let's say I'm that me, I'm the medium team. So I started out, I'm the small team, I'm just the agent and the admin, and now we're adding a few buyer agents. Now we're getting into that medium-sized team. I'm already tracking my GCI, my volume. I used to always track average commission. And I would always track our average commission um, compared to the other top teams in our market center, um, because yeah. you can go right into the MyKW reports and yeah. see what everybody's GCI is and how many agents are on the team. Um, yeah. So I like to know how profitable uh, or how what our average commission was, because that told me, do we need to work on our scripts? Um, if we were lower than the other top teams, we could do the same amount of business and make more money if we worked on our scripts on commission objections, for example. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's fascinating. Like I, um, 
one thing that now that you say that average commission, um, when I think about what our average commission is, which I know we, when we ask for a certain commission, we get it. Like there's usually no uh, concessions on that until the end. It doesn't come up front, it comes at the end. And I'm just now realizing it through this phone call. So thank you for saying this. That's interesting, that's complete opposite uh -huh. for me, right? So at the end, when something's about to fall apart or so say the um, seller took the fridge and they were supposed to leave it and we end up paying for a fridge or some repairs that weren't done or whatever X, Y, Z thing is, um, Ron just told me, I put, I put that in the, I just want this off my plate as fast as possible file so I can get on with my life. And I just told him the other day, I said, that file's too big. Because to me, he wants it off of his plate and move on to the next. I'm like bottom line focused, right? And it just occurred to me that although we didn't give up commissions up front, we gave them up at the end. And that was by our choice. It's not usually because someone asks us to, it's by choice, but now I'm wondering how much is that? And I know that's in the PL because I do see the profit and loss and he does keep track of that number. Um, I just never connected the two until right now. So now you can track your net commission. Yeah, yeah another um, thing that I used to track as our team got larger was all the vendors that we did business with um, on the lender side and the title side. And I wanted to know how much business um, we were giving to each vendor and how much each vendor was giving it giving to us. Yeah. Um, so we have a question that just came in from Joellen. Um, okay, so we're getting into the how to track it. All right, well, we're get, Joellen, give us a second and we're gonna get into the how to track it, I think, next. Let's just go right into that. Yeah. So how are we tracking Obviously, we have stuff, you're on the high end where you have a high C mega who has created your own like massive database, whatever you want to call it on steroids. Mm -hmm. And then we have starting from fresh. So if I'm starting at the beginning, how are you guys tracking when you guys were new on the team and your team was smaller? Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. It's just the easiest way. The number of... Uh, YouTube videos on how to ca make calculations and tables and pie charts is numerous and they come out with fresh stuff all the time. So learning that stuff is super easy and it's super accessible. There's no like extra fees involved in using Excel or even Google Sheets. Sheets. Yeah. Yep. And then who th that kind of looped in with that question of how are you tracking is who is tracking and who is recording? How are you getting the data? How are you getting agents to give you what you need? Are you responsible for the data? Steph, I know you have a really strong opinion on this topic. I do. Um, obviously, it goes back to systems. There's got, there's got to be a trigger and a process for every number you track. I don't just hope that someone's going to tell me that we have a Zillow review that I need to track and add to our system. I just don't hope that someone's gonna tell me that they went on an appointment. There's a system for everything. So it all runs through our process. So there's a trigger for every number we track, if that makes what sense. What do you mean? Yeah, I love that. A trigger for every number. So give me an example, a couple of examples. So for example, when we have a new, we get a phone call and the agent or the ISA takes the phone call and they set an appointment. They literally, as their process goes, they have a little thing that they do every single time. They fill out the intake form with all the information as they're talking on the phone. It guides them. How soon are you looking to buy? What's your budget? Have you looked with any agents? All the LP mama questions, right, are on that form. And then it has a little checklist for them. They log it in our database. They log the date the lead was received, the source, the date the appointment was set on, and the date that it was set for, and which agent it was set for. That sheet then goes to the agent and the agent takes it with them on their appointment. Those sheets are due back to our ops team by noon the next business day with what priority label do we want on this person? How soon are they looking to buy or sell? And then the ops team takes it from there. They make sure a plan's launched in brevity, the label's applied, that the, the appointment got logged, that it actually happened. They upload it and save it and we move on. And now we know if we don't have a sheet, two things happened. Either one, the appointment didn't show up, 
or two, the agent forgot to turn it in. And the ISAs will go chase those down. They run a report every day that says, show me missing green sheets. I had an appointment set. I don't have an appointment. So yet. before you guys had ISAs and you have agents making their own appointments, how are you handling that? Same exact way. They were responsible for filling out the green sheet. And it's that's still that way on our team today because agents set some of their own appointments. So agents are on the road making appointments. They're at home at night. They're just carrying those forms with them. On a tear pad. Okay. Love yep. that. Yep. In their car. They, we're, we tell them to have them in their car, at their house, and at the office. Okay. And Elizabeth, what about how are, how are you tracking? Who's doing the tracking? Who's doing the reporting? For the most part, it's all me. <laughs> like, I, I have five agents on my team, and I have an additional admin support, and then my lead agent. And for the most part, it is still all me. I'm still doing all of the green sheets and the commission letters and all of that. Um, so anything that the um, is money driven, it's on me. My lead agent still does the P&L um, and pays the bills and runs the expenses that way. Um, and yet, especially with the source type, um, with him running an ROI on the sources, that's how we ended up dropping Zillow because we had a baseline of four times ROI. For every dollar I spent on Zillow, I wanted four in return. And when it dropped below that, we got rid of it. So it was actually a combination of two people on that particular piece. Um, I've, I have attempted, and I think it's just a matter of there were no consequences to not doing it. And not only that, but when my second admin quit and I had to take over everything, like, Sometimes you just have to let things go and a lot of tracking got let go. So getting that back has been difficult because once the agents get used to not reporting, they quit reporting and asking them to do it again. They're like, it's a whole new world. Like it's a completely new planet and I've never asked them to do that before. So um, I don't wanna rely on them for that information. I would rather just look at their calendar and see it. And yet I still have agents who don't even book their appointments on their calendar. So the work in progress, the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love your transparency. So let's talk about that because I think for our team, um, when I was doing the tracking, what became really important was for the connection to be made between I'm doing this tracking activity, whatever it is the agent is doing and actually understanding why and how that could make their business better. Mm -hmm. so, Part of that was the transparency and the sharing of the information. So Steph, would you screen share and pull up your um, report that goes out to your team every single day? Um, Absolutely. I love this. Let's see if we can. Uh, All right, can you guys see that? I can see it, yeah. can you guys see it? You should be good. So this is our agent hustle board, and this is total transparent accountability across all agents. And it tells them how many current pendings they have, how many contracts they've written this month, how many days since their last contract, what's their average number of days between contracts. And of course it's color coded. So Jacob, for instance, if you scroll down to Jacob, he's the fourth one there, his average days between contact is four, or contracts is 14. He's currently at 21 days, so it turns red. Like he's in the red zone. He hasn't written a contract in more than his average days, right? And so it just runs across and this is complete accountability across everybody. It goes out to every single agent, every team member on our team, every single day by 11 a.m. Is that hosted in Sheets or Excel online? Or? This is Excel um, and it pulls from our access database, our Microsoft access database. So the data is coming from the database, but um, Liz, my EA, is the one who pulls this every day. And Sean's such a techno weenie, he literally, she pushes a couple buttons and it refreshes and it does its thing. Nice. Stephanie, would you screenshot that after the call and just post that in the group? Because I think that's Absolutely. an awesome report. Yep. Um, I love this. What we found is... It, it allows people to really focus on the areas they need to work on. And it also creates um, horizontal accountability within the team instead of top-down accountability um, from the leadership down. And it also is kind of a, you know, I can help you with this encouragement from one teammate to another. Like I see you're struggling here. Can I help you? Right. Um, yeah. And Mike, as a leader, 
Yeah. Give Mike us some hearts on the live, you guys, if you like the hustle board. And Mike is a leader on our team, right? Mike Hicks, he's also an agent. And he goes on this agent hustle board. He has no problem putting his numbers up there. Obviously, he's a freaking rock star because he's got 29 pendings right now himself. <laughs> That's right? what happens when you create the promise. Right. His average days between contracts is three. The guy writes a contract every three days. And right now he's at four. He just got one accepted last night. So it'll go back to being green again. But he has total accountability across the whole team, just like everybody else does. I love that. That's awesome. Um, did you have a second report you were going to show stuff? I don't remember. Oh, I have a few if you guys want to see them. Yeah. Um, I see can them. you see this one? I don't know. You guys give us hearts if you want to see the, her other reports. <laughs> Okay, the sub, like what's up? Okay, so up of course, there? we are the team of acronyms. If anybody knows our team, every time I'm like, no more acronyms. Like, <laughs> so sub is show up. Are they showing up for the daily kickoff meeting in the morning? We call it winning minute um, for team meeting on Tuesdays and for CLS, which is coaching, learning, and scripting on Tuesdays. It's an so hour. this is another thing that you're actually tracking. So in Correct. terms of as your team grows, these are other success measures that you're measuring, that you're measuring for success. Right. So those three things again, the what? going up, the show up. Um, winning minute every morning at 830 in the morning. Okay. It's CLS, which is coaching, learning, and scripting. It's Tuesdays for an hour. Okay. And then our team meeting on Tuesdays for an hour. Those awesome. three things are show up. Do you have a standard around those things? Uh, yeah. Did her sound just cut out? Or is yeah. that just... Okay. Stuff you cut out. Let's say that again. What's your standard around those things? Your Ew. I don't know. Somehow she. I don't know what happened to her sound. Boo. She's going to log in on her phone. Maybe. Or she's going to type it into her phone. <laughs> I was going to say, and or Elizabeth, oh, do you want to pull up your... Um, yeah, I can. So she typed in there. It was 90%. They have to come to 90% of each. Um, okay. So the standard is 90%. Oh, perfect. I see you there. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, or else they're in trouble at 70%. That will come back to you when you get sound. <laughs> and then Elizabeth, you want to pull yes. up what you have? Yeah, let's just do that. I have that right here. If they could drop below 75%, then they stop getting leads. Ah. Okay, love that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So so good to see what Elizabeth's tracking sheet looks like. Okay. And can you see mine? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay, so I I track per agent, and with the lead agent, this is because he gets a cut of every agent's um, commission. I have just a rolling spreadsheet of of everything, everything all this year, and then I break it out for easy reference, so my lead agent can see this by month of how much money he's making every month, and then how many units and how many uh, what the volume is for the month. And so you can see everything above the black line is closed. Everything below the black line is pending. And then I have, just because oh, I, I, love wish, arts. I wish I had more time to do what Stephanie's done. Um, I could probably make time, but I find other things more important. So uh, this is my answer to that, which is um, where the sources are coming from and what percent. And I broke it down like this, the source is just a regular source. The subsource is more grouped together. So things like past clients, COI, um, referrals from past clients are all grouped in subsource COI. So I can see those are the types of people who are coming to our events, which we, we have done for the last couple of years, we're averaging eight out of 12 months, we'll do an event for eight months out of 12. Um, which as you can see for 64%, that's paying off nicely. Um, paid referrals are things like Dave Ramsey, Zillow, anything that we owe a referral fee on. And then you can see this was expired and canceled and internet leads um, kind of make up the rest. And I don't know what the orange sliver is. That might be lawn signs. Um, but then the, we have the three pillars of business, 
which um, I track for each agent. This is just as a group overall. Um, I track for each agent. And this is, again, where our business is coming from because that's how we know um, whether having an agent on the team is paying off for us. So we, if you've heard the expression lead receivers and lead um, generators, right? You have agents on your team who are really good at taking a lead that you give them and converting them into something. And you have agents on the team who are good at generating their own business and bringing it to the team that we would not have had otherwise. So we break that down into three pillars. The first one is um, Ron's past clients, Ron's sphere of influence, um, anyone that he has direct influence over, and he's usually is handing those off as appointments to the agents on our team rather than working that business himself. That's pillar one. Can you, two, Elizabeth, can you pull up, you had showed me before the report that you have that you um, give to your agents once a month, each yes. agent? Yep. Because I think you have the, the um, pillar. Yep. Because this makes a little bit more sense on an individual agent basis. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So do you meet with your agent once once a month to go over the report or you just send them the report and they're used to looking at it? They get this once a week. So oh, I, okay. yeah, I print this and give it to them at the team meeting once a week. And if they have any questions or concerns about it, then we do have a discussion. Um, but for the most part, this is a, an FYI type of situation. Um, in a con you know, in something like this where someone who has closed 20 so far this year and only has one pending, trust me, we've had a conversation about that. You know, what I, one of the things I love about this is um, the opportunity to reinforce your value proposition. So your team, each team is a little bit different. We used to have a pie and we would divide the pie in half and 50% of the pie was team generated and 50% was agent generated. That was our goal. You guys are more like kind of like an 80 20, I think, with your three pillars. Yeah. But it gives you the opportunity to reinforce the value proposition with your agent because a lot of times an agent will be very focused on their sphere of influence business yeah. because they think, why am I giving you so much of my split? I should get more of this. Yes. And forget that the majority of their business may have been yes. team generated. So now you're reinforcing that each time you give them yeah. the report. That's exactly the conversation. Yeah. And that's why we tell them. So pillar two is the Dave Ramsey leads, the things that require conversion on the agent's behalf. But we are paying something to generate those leads for the agents. And pillar three is anything they generate on their own, calling expireds for sell by owners, canceled, and anyone from their sphere. And the standard is to get that to 20% within the first six months of being on the team, you should be able to get 20% of your business should be coming from that third pillar. Because I don't want just a bunch of people who can, I can hire anybody to you know, be a lead receiver. I need, I need somebody that is going to bring in that extra piece for us that we wouldn't get on our own. Right, yeah, that it's a win-win. Yes, everybody. yep. So let's go to the question, so two things. Um, I want to come circle back to leading and lagging indicators. And I think as teams start out, they're typically tracking the lagging indicators. Lagging indicator meaning the results, meaning closings, closed units, closed GCI, closed volume. And in the beginning, we don't necessarily track the leading indicators. But what we found over time is that the leading indicators became much more important than the lagging indicators because if the leading indicators are on track, you don't have to worry about the lagging indicators. What leading indicators are you guys both tracking? Steph, do we have your volume back? Nope. Nope. All right. Go off and come back on on your phone. Perfect. What leading indicators are you guys tracking, Elizabeth? Um, again, this is one of those things that I haven't gotten back on track with. It used to be appointment set. That if you can, if you're setting two appointments every week, you you will have an amazing business. And I know for certain that that was happening at one point, and now that's not. So the conversation then is, how do you get them back on track? And we did have a mid-year conversation about that to say, um, you know, where where did you want to be? Where are you now? And what will it take to get you there? And right. So we've had that conversation back to, look, if you can just set two appointments 
a week, what would that get you? What would your life look like at that point to get a recommitment, a rebuy-in um, to that to that system? Right. So yeah, that's my. That's I think that's easier. probably the, the the most basic place to start yep. with leading indicators would be yep. appointments. Yep. Steph, do we have your sound back? I don't know. Do I? No. Yes, yes. we do. Oh, we got yeah. that. Good. So, what leading indicators are you guys tracking? Um, the really crucial ones to us is the ISA department. So how many new leads did we get? How many attempts did we make? How many people were we able to connect with? And how many appointments did we set? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty basic. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then let's talk about who is reviewing. So we have all this data. We're tracking all this data. It may be as simple as just closings, units, sources of business, and it may be as complicated as how many times John Smith sneezed last week? If you're on Stephanie's team, <laughs> so I do actually say that. every day there's my sneeze for the day, so I do track my sneezes. Oh my it's gosh! Not a lie. <laughs> so, what are we doing with all this data? Who is reviewing it? How frequently are you reviewing it? What are you comparing it to? What? How do you take the data and take and pull the story out of it? And then what are you doing from there? So, Steph, you want to start with that? Yeah, so our daily, daily leadership report, we have a daily leadership. That's not one of the ones I showed you, but that's the one that has, let me pull it up here. That's the one that's got new leads, attempts, ISA connects, all that stuff, listing rep signs, contract, GCI. Um, we so reviewed that. 12, that's your 12. Important. That's the 12. Exactly. Yep. And we do this week, our week goal this month, our month goal this year, our year goal. So um, that report, the leadership team gets every single day, and then we discuss it in our leadership meetings on Thursdays, and right? Anything alarming? Yeah, is there something that needs attention? And then that hustle board goes to the whole team every day, and that we use that hustle board in our, um, the agenda item on our leadership meeting is team news, and that's when we cover that, like who's struggling, who needs help, who should we be sitting down with and having a conversation with who needs to self-select off the team who's a rock star and is just kicking it killing it and what do we need to do for that person to help them who's yeah. in your leadership meeting myself our cro chief revenue officer aka sales manager sean who's the ceo and mike who's the owner half owner and chief advisor okay and how often are you looking at things like seasonality, year over year, year over past year, year over best year? Um, so the way we the way we approach data, and you, you guys and I talked about this earlier, is it information only? Or is it actionable? Or is it causing us to go get more information? So some indicators on our thing say, oh, we need to dig into that. What's the issue there? Like, for instance, when I showed the hustle board, Katya hasn't written a, a contract in like 22 days or something. Well, Katya was on, she was out for two and a half weeks, right? So we have to go get more data because this number isn't telling the whole story. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of numbers on our dashboards that drive additional research. So if something flags us, like some person is out or sales are down, what's going on? Then we go back. Okay. Are we down in leads? Are we down in appointments? What's, what's causing us to be down in sales? Yeah. And are you tracking to goal? Are you tracking year over year, year over best year? Like what are you tracking as you're going through your year? I laugh because that's always a debate because every time we get into going to track, Sean's like, okay, so now do we do it? A rolling 30, a year to date, a year over last year, uh, this January over. So it's, we track it always. Every single way you can think of tracking it, that's how we track it. You guys are the extreme, you guys are on the one extreme. So let's yeah. get Elizabeth on the other extreme. Yeah. Um, what, who's reviewing and what happens from that review? How often are you reviewing the information? What does that conversation look like? Yeah. Ours is much more, uh, organic in the moment. It's very not purposeful, um, except for the meeting itself. So my Mega and I have two meetings on the calendar every week, one at the beginning of the week, which is a, um, what, what do you have going on this week? How can I help? Um, you know, where, where do you foresee any problems? And we, we sort of have that meeting at the beginning to spearhead the week. 
our Friday meeting is an, our numbers meeting. And it's just the two of us. And we will pull out these reports and go, are we making enough money? Are the agents making enough money? Where is our business coming from? You know, how many people did we have at our event last week? And did we reach out to all of them? Like it's a very in the moment conversation over what happened for the past week. And then any trends that I might see, I'll pull out those um, year over year reports about once a quarter and go, okay, well for this quarter compared to last, you know, this year, last quarter, um, we're here. And then we'll, we'll kind of spot some trends that way. Um, and n usually, as long as we see the trend line motioning up, like it, it just nudges up. Like we don't have any huge spikes up. Ours are nudges. As long as we still see those nudges, like we're happy. And as long as the agents are still nudging up, we're happy. It's when we see any spikes down that we're like, oh, okay, Pull the plug here. Who do we need to like have an intervention with? So our, go ahead. Yeah, like I said, ours are very just organic in the moment. Whatever I happen to see and bring to his attention, um, and then because he's not a numbers guy, he's like, tell me what you see and and the story that it tells, mm -hmm. and where you think we need to turn our focus to, and we'll go there. So I think if you are in a market where. Um, you are seeing either the W market where things are up and down, or you're in a market where things are shifting downward. That means you need to look at your numbers more frequently. Yeah. Um, one of the things I remember uh, from Scott Schumann, when he was doing a presentation at Family Reunion recently, he said, we used to always track um, month over month. So January of this year, as compared to January of last year, and we would track year to date over year to date last year. and as if your team's been around and you've gone through a shift and maybe last year it wasn't your best year, like maybe your best year was three years ago, then you went down and you started coming back up again, make sure you're not just tracking year over year. You should be tracking year over best year so that you can continue to really propel up. Otherwise, you can trick yourself into thinking, I'm doing better than I was last year, but right. I'm really not tracking to where I have the potential to track. Um, I have a couple questions. So Melanie wants to know, what are the high points that you are printing and giving at every team meeting and what does that look like? Ours go out in um, emails every day. So we don't print them in different. Yeah. Team meeting. Okay. Go ahead. Team meetings usually MLS data. What, what's our market share versus the MLS? How many listings have we taken versus all the other teams in our market center? How many pendings do we have versus all the other teams? And our goal is to always be number one across those metrics. And then our market share goal is 20%. Wow. That 20% market share. That's huge. That's the difference between Idaho and DC area. <laughs> our team used to be the number one team in the top city that we all lived in. And we only had one and a half percent market share. Wow. Wow. We're, we're at about four, 13 or 14 right now. That's and interesting. Shooting for 20. So Elizabeth, what do you guys share at your team meeting? Um, our team meetings are mostly um, in the moment things. Like what do I need everyone to know that I want to make sure I have a face-to-face -face conversation with them or training or um, in the moment. I don't do any numbers at the meeting. Not doing numbers at meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. I hand them their their spreadsheet, and that's as as numbery as we get at the team meeting. So we used to always look at our year to date goal and where we were towards the goal in terms of GCI units and volume, and then quarterly we would I would do a report about sources of business um, and average commission. Those were kind of the the things that we. Um, tracked. Um, Deb Church asked, and I think Steph, you just answered this. Do either of you compare your numbers to the market center or MLS numbers? Yeah, we don't. Always. We never. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so funny. Maybe we should. Then maybe we would sell 800 houses in a year. We're just slightly competitive, just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we always did that too with the market center. Nothing okay, question from Casey. So tracking year to date and year to best year, how do you determine what your goal should be for the next year? Mm. So how do you guys, that's a great question. That would be another, probably another whole conversation. We have about five minutes to go. Yeah. 
um, about goal setting. How we do you take guys our, yeah, we, every fall at our offsite, we have each individual agent with a goal worksheet. If they're new to the team and they don't have a full year's conversion metrics, we give them the team average. If they have been with the team for more than a year, they get their conversion metrics and we start, it starts at the top and says, how much do you want to make? Right. And if they say, I want to make a hundred grand, it breaks it down for them and they go through all the conversion metrics and fill in the numbers, which means they have to go on so many appointments, take, sign so many reps. Do so. so that's, and then we take all those numbers and add them up and that's how we get the team goals. And if there's a gap, right, if we say, okay, the team wants to do a thousand units and all our agents added up is 700 units, we need to go hire five more agents to do those additional units. Right. That's and how now we do it. really is the time um, to be talking about things like that, right? So leadership activities for 2020 start now, yeah. right? Because if I want to recruit an agent, get them into production and have them have closings, that needs to be happening now. And then team activities really kind of fourth quarter is the beginning of 2020 for the people on the team. That's kind of how we used to look, look at it. Yeah. Um, Melanie asked, what are the team averages for conversions? Melanie, are you asking like what the actual numbers are for Stephanie's team? Put, put that in the comments. We'll come back to that. And then Casey asked, what if, what if you, your team loses four or five buyer's agents? You hire more. <laughs> we have a, we, we have actually found, I mean, we lost our heavy hitter in March, um, that was with the Anderson group before the merger, he did um, 80 to 100 units as a buyer's agent and he did 150 units as a listing agent and we lost him. And all of those sales have been picked up by other members of the team. We have, our sales have not gone down, right? We just hire more people to service the business. That's and your it, tribute to lead generation and systems right there. Yes, yes. Love that. Um, okay, so let, let me tackle, we had the, the final question because we're getting close to our hour here. The last question was, what do you do when leading indicators you are tracking are not meeting standards? So if you have a standard for appointments or for contacts and people are not hitting that, what happens? And what do you do when your lagging indicators are not meeting the goals that you set? What are your systems for that was the question. I'll let either one of you jump in on that. Yeah, that's all you, Steph. Okay. <laughs> and if you're listening and you want to um, comment on that too, please comment on that. So if leading indicators, um, we've actually, since we've merged teams and we have a chief revenue officer that can have these really tough conversations with agents, we've had about, I think we've had four agents so far that have self-selected off the team and it was all based on numbers. All of the conversation was always around the numbers. So um, performance improvement plans are a thing on our team. You know, if you're not, if you, and, and here's the thing, there has to be some amount of pain associated with not meeting team standards or people will just continue to not meet team standards. Right. So we have our team standards set and the pain, if you don't meet them is you don't get team leads. And if you don't get team leads, you're never going to make your goal. We're about a 50, 50, we provide 50% of their leads. They provide 50%. They get paid more on their leads. So we hope that that um, entices them to go generate some of their own leads. And a lot of our agents, I mean, we have, Mike Hicks hasn't taken a team lead yet. Those 29 appointments are all his own stuff. So there is incentive for them to do that, but definitely there's a conversation when they're not meeting team standards and there's a pain point if they're not doing it. And the pain point is no leads. So, so your director of sales basically is having those conversations. And then Elizabeth, are you having those conversations with agents or is Ron having those conversations on your team? I was uh, back when I had only the listings and I had a transaction coordinator. And since we changed how we do our admin side, I am way back heavier into in the business versus on the business. Um, whereas before I was much more on the business and that's when I was having those conversations. Now that I'm not, I'm I'm out of it, and Ron hasn't picked up the slack on that. I'll just be honest um, in saying that. Oh, no, just right. <laughs> I'm sure he'll go back and watch this though, because <laughs> <laughs> I think he should. And um, and that needs to happen again. Those I I do think weekly conversations around accountability 
are crucial. And we've gotten so far away from that, that each agent is really acting um, entrepreneurially and doing okay. I just don't think we're, we haven't had the candor type of conversations that need to happen for people to self-select off. That's why they're still hanging on. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good insight. I think when you grow large enough, you, the fear of loss goes away. Yes, your small oh, it does. Your loss yeah. is very big when you only have a handful of agents on your team. That um, was definitely ours when we were just Anderson Group. We had five agents and there was always the fear of if we lose one agent, we lose a fifth of our business. Right. Yeah. That could be a future conversation about accountability and how to uh, get people to either self-select off or actually buy into a, a performance improvement plan. So that reminds me, if you guys are still with us on the call, I want you guys to comment and um, put in the comments what topic you want us to hit next. Um, these are really organic conversations. We want it to be a group conversation. Um, so we're not set on any topics. These are real things that um, Steph and Elizabeth are dealing with with their teams. Um, what all three of us are dealing with with all the teams that we coach. Um, so I really want to have all of you um, put in what you want to talk about next time. Steph, I noticed on your report, um, one of the things that happens when people aren't hitting standards on your team was similar to the way that I used to run my team, which is at a certain point, um, if they have not done what they need to do, then they're not eligible for leads until they get caught up. So Correct. what are the things that you measure there for that? So it's showing up it's the SUPs and the DRTs. So the SUPs are showing up and DRTs are doing the right things. And what so are doing are they, the right things? Are they behind on their tasks in Brevity? Do they have overdue tasks for lead follow-up in Brevity? Um, are they, they get points for doing open houses and door knocking and circle prospecting. So they have a point threshold where they need to be that gets them to do the right thing points and they have a threshold where they have to be. So so it's very black and white and everybody's clear on what the standards are and it just automatically kicks in when totally. it triggers. Okay. Yep. And that. there's no question about it. The ISAs get that report every day and it says who's lead eligible and that's who they'll set appointments for that day. Love that. Nice. Okay. Super. All right. So I think that was all the questions. Um, I think there's a couple more in there, but um, we'll we can back. answer them by writing. I was gonna say, we'll come back and comment in the group. Yeah. And if you guys are interested in getting, um, I think we called it the ultimate list of things you can track. It's literally five, four or five typed pages of things yeah. that Stephanie's team tracks on the way to a thousand units. Um, just private message me your email address and I will email that to you. And, um, and it's not pretty. It literally was just okay. like me brain dumping onto an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, well, I put it on some pretty stationery. Okay, and good. I'll post, um, later this afternoon, who our winner of predictable success is, and I'll message you to get your address. And if you are not signed up for Ops Boss Leader Retreat, um, that prices are going up at the end of August. You guys want to be there. It is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, once a year event for high level EAs, directors of operations and chief operating officers. And we actually have a few CEOs of seventh level teams as well. So um, sign up for that. If you're a newer EA, you wanna know about Elizabeth's uh, group coaching and training center. And if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching, all three of us are available for that. So I'm gonna thank you guys for joining us for our first coffee with Christy and crew. And I want to see what you guys actually start tracking. If you're new to this, what your first tracking sheet looks like posted in the group. If you're already like on a level eight, let's see what your level nine or 10 tracking looks like. We would love to see your ideas in the group because it'll help somebody else. And I think that's great. So anything else to add you guys? I don't I think, think so. I'll post my sheets in the group. Awesome. Great. Have a great week, you guys, and go get bossy, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Bye.